Hello friends and welcome to my channel. Victorian morning wear and morning rituals never cease to fascinate us. They frequently show up in horror movies and period dramas, often colored with gothic fantasy. But what were the rules and how did people mourn up north here in Finland? Firstly, I must admit that I'm not an expert in this subject and with a couple of days of research this is what I could find out. As the customs in Finland were often regional and class related, and chains along the centuries, it is hard to find any generalizations. But I hope this video gives a sort of glimpse into Finnish morning in the 19th century. And if you are interested, you can use the links in the descriptions to find out more. The earliest known examples of black morning clothing are from ancient Rome. For a long time, black garments that required a lot of processing to get the dark color were only worn by the aristocracy. Similarly, the morning dress was worn by aristocracy only, and there were even sumptuary laws forbidding lower classes from wearing black. Like with many other customs and fashions, the lower classes started gradually mimicking the upper classes. In 1734, Swedish law, Finland was part of Sweden at that point, stated that a widow's mourning period was one year, during which she couldn't remarry. For a widower, the mourning period was half of that. During the Victorian times, the morning customs developed into an art form. After losing Prince Albert, Queen Victoria of Britain went into mourning for the rest of her life. This led to the popularization of mourning wear and strict mourning etiquette. Although the rules weren't written into laws and there were different opinions on how the mourning should proceed, following the morning customs showed decency and was very important to the Victorians. Morning warehouses offered ready-made morning garments, accessories, stationery, whatever one could need during this period. The poorer were forced to borrow garments or dyed their garments black. In Finland, the morning customs were a bit less strict, but there were many similarities. People draped their house in white or sometimes in black. Women wore black or grey clothes with white colours and aprons. They also switched their bright silk caps into black ones and switched the lace under them into white cloth. Those that couldn't afford silk caps wore black or white scarves on their head. In Eastern Finland, married Orthodox Christian women wore a cap called sorokka. A typical sorokka was decorated with bright red embroidery. When morning, the women donned a special morning sorokka that was decorated with dark blue, brown, green and white. As far as I know, morning veils were not a thing among common folk. The upper classes followed European fashions and donned black dresses made out of non-reflective silk or bombazin and decorated with crepe. If worn, morning jewelry was made out of jet or cheaper ebonite. Jewelry made out of deceased person's hair was a popular way to keep part of the loved one close. Although hair jewelry was also made out of living people's hair, so not all hair containing jewelry pieces are mourning related. Outside, women wore mourning bonnets, hats or caps with a black veil that was made out of crepe, a stiff, non-reflective silk fabric. During the first few months of mourning, the veil covered the face, but was later fastened to the bonnet so that it hung at the back only. To make the veil, I bought a very cheap remnant of dark blue silk chiffon. It wasn't black, but I knew I could always dye it black. I first boiled some water and then mixed the black dye in. Then I filled the whole pot with cold water. It is recommended to add a bit of vinegar if you are dyeing silk. Then I can add the silk. After that it is just slow heating and mixing and then slow cooling. The 
the dye result was perfect. To make the veil, I first have to get rid of the damaged edges of the fabric. This is probably the reason why the silk was so cheap. I pressed folds to the edges as this fabric is very shifty. Then I only needed to sew the hems in place. For the hat, I started with a cheap vintage style hat that I found in a flea market. I cut the crown off and shaped it to have this little point at the front that I have seen in many period hats. I also took the folded ribbon that was around the original hat and decided to use it for the decoration. These black flowers also came with the original hat. If I so wanted, I could pin them to the hat or my hair. To keep this hat in place, I sewed a comb to the inside. This works much better for my slippery hair than hat pins. White morning garments and accessories like handkerchiefs were trimmed with black. Even the stationery used during the morning period had black edges. Women had more morning rules than men. Of course, men tended to dress in black suits already. Generally, it was enough to add a black hatband, the width of which depended on the closeness of the disease. A black armband could also be worn, especially with uniforms. Children didn't have a morning period, still they could be dressed in white, in which sometimes a black trim was added. Before the 20th century people died at home. Washing and dressing of the body was done by the family, although there were some professionals that could be hired to help. Wakes were common among the higher classes. The body was laid to rest at home and the mourners were allowed to see the deceased and to say their final goodbyes. The wake room was draped in white or black. The windows, mirrors, tables and chairs were covered. Candles and flowers were brought in for decoration. Spruce trees and branches were brought to decorate the entrance of the house and spruce tree branches were spread on the floor. Even when there was no wake, the body was often held at home, perhaps in a barn or sauna. Funerals used to be the biggest celebration a person had in their life or, well, death during the 17th century. Families even went into debt in order to provide the most lavish funeral they possibly could. During the 18th century, the funerals developed into more private occasions, but towards the end of the 19th century, big funerals grew in popularity. Funeral proceedings were grand. The proceedings started at the family house. In the biggest funerals, the crowd of mourners was divided in groups led by a mourning marshal carrying a mourning rod covered with somber clothes. The marshal's job was to lead each party. In the countryside, the journey to the graveyard was sometimes long and the funeral party was forced to stop for rest. At the rest place, a tree was chosen and the branches were chopped off and the bark was removed from one area. The initials of the deceased and the date was carved into the tree that was called Karasikko. Another version of this tradition was to carve a board beforehand and then fasten it to the tree on the way to the graveyard. Sometimes the board was simply hammered to the wall of the family home. It was believed that the soul of the deceased might try to come back to haunt the family, but that when seeing Karsikko, the soul understood that they were now dead and turned back. After the funeral, a feast was provided. A lovely custom in Finland was to hand each attendant a funeral confection. These were decorated sugar sweets that people were not meant to eat, but to store as a memento. I had this other piece of black wool fabric that I didn't need for the dress. 
This was just perfect amount to make a pretty cape. I took the pattern from Gordon's turn of the century fashion patterns and tailoring techniques. Basically, it's just a three-quarter circle. I divided the length in three parts to make three layers. I then made tons of bias tape from the leftover fabric to finish the hems. Here are all the three layers. I already started hemming the middle one. I sewed the bias tape to the right side. Then I pressed the tape to the wrong side and basted it in place. I finished the hem with a machine. The front opening got folded to the wrong side and stitched. Before finishing the neckline, I basted all the layers together. Then I sewed a bias tape to the neckline. I notched the neckline seam allowance, turned the bias tape evenly over the edge and finished by hand. Then it was time to add some decoration. I still had lots of that looped soutache, so I added that over the stitching lines at the hem. I didn't have a good pressure foot for this in my singer, so I had to switch over to my modern machine. I also added a bit of that braiding I had on my skirt to the neckline.
At the end of the 19th century, doctors started warning about the harmful effects that wearing mourning veils could cause. The crepe was not only hot and stifling, but it also emitted harmful poisonous dye particles that caused respiratory issues. Slowly, the custom changed and the crepe was switched into lighter silk and the veils were shortened. World War I finally saw the end of complicated mourning rituals in Europe and in America. There was so much death and people felt that the rituals were unnecessary theatre among all the suffering they already faced. The First World War didn't touch Finland, although the killing of the Tsar of Russia led to our declaration of independence. Still, we ended up fighting with ourselves in a bloody civil war in 1918. I managed to find this Civil War era picture of a veiled woman buying spruce branches in Helsinki Marketplace. Perhaps the spruce branches were meant to decorate the house in mourning. Still, the veils went out of use everywhere else except at funerals. My mother still remembers her mom, my grandmother, owning a veil. Even the funeral use of veils decreased toward the end of the 20th century. Nowadays, the only thing remaining from the 19th century mourning costumes are the black clothes we wear at funerals. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video topic interesting and please subscribe to my channel and please comment down below. Are there some customs that weren't mentioned here and does your region have specific rituals that you find um, particularly interesting or fascinating? See you soon. Bye.